Track 44 1. Would it be okay if I have friends to visit? It depends how long for. It's fine if it's just a few days. 2. Would you mind if I cooked for myself sometimes? Not at all, as long as you clean up after yourself. 3. Do I have to be home before a certain time? No, not at all, as long as you're quiet if you're back late. 4. Can I use the washing machine whenever I like? Within reason. Obviously, I don't want you washing clothes in the middle of the night. 5. Would it be possible to move a table into my room? I'm afraid not, no. The two we have are needed downstairs. 6. Is it OK if I play music in my room? Of course, within reason. Obviously, you shouldn't play it too loud. Track 45 Do you fancy going out later? Yeah, maybe. What's on? Well, do you like horror films? Yeah, if I'm in the right mood. Why? Well, there's this Brazilian film on in town that I'd quite like to see. It's got English subtitles, so it should be OK. Oh, right. So, what's it about then? What's the plot? Well, apparently it's about zombies taking over Brasilia. That sounds fun. Yeah, and the special effects are supposed to be amazing as well. Cool. So, when's it on? There's a showing at just after nine, and then a late one at twelve. OK. Well, I'm not sure I want to go to the late one. I need to be up quite early tomorrow. That's OK. The ten past nine showing is good for me. Where's it on? The capital. OK then, great. Track 46. So, do you know where the cinema is? I think so. Isn't the capital that one near the river? No, that's the ABC. Oh, uh, right. Well, in that case, no, I'm not sure. The capital's in the centre, on Crown Street. OK. I don't know it then. You know Oxford Road, yeah? Well, that's the main street which goes past the railway station. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you have your back to the station, you turn right down Oxford Road, you walk about 200 metres and you go past a post office. OK. And the next street after that is Crown Street. The cinema's along there, about halfway down on the left. Oh, yeah. I think I know the place now. There's a big sweet shop right opposite, isn't there? That's the one. OK, so if the programme starts at ten past nine, what time do you want to meet? Shall I just meet you on the steps outside at nine? Can we make it eight thirty? We want to be sure we get a ticket. <laughs> I doubt it will be that busy, but I suppose we could get there a bit earlier. We can always get a coffee before the film starts. Exactly. Maybe whoever gets there first should start queuing, OK? OK, but I don't think we need to worry. I don't think that many people will want to see a Brazilian zombie movie. Hey, you never know. Track 47 1 You know Columbus Avenue? Well, the restaurant's about halfway down there. 2 The bus stop is right in front of the main entrance to the station. 3 you know the post office? Well, St Anne's Road is the next turning down from there, on the other side of the road. 4. You know the cinema? Well, there's a car park at the back. 5. You know the main square? Well, Hope Close is one of the streets off there. 6. If you have your back to the station, you turn left. 7. If you're facing the station, the shop will be on your right. 8. If you're coming down the road, away from the station, Church Street's the second turning on the left. 9. If you're going up the road towards the station and away from the river, Pemberton Road's the second on the right. 10. When you come out of the building, 
you'll see the cinema right opposite. Track 48 1 So, how was it? Oh, it was brilliant. Much better than I thought it'd be. Really? I'd heard it wasn't that good. Well, me too, but I actually really enjoyed it. So, what's so good about it? Oh, the story, the acting, everything. It's just really funny, and it's quite exciting too. I don't know. Maybe it's because I didn't think it'd be anything special. I know what you mean. You see so many films these days where there's so much advanced publicity, especially from Hollywood. It's all in the papers and everyone's saying, you have to go and see it. And then you go and you just end up thinking it was a bit overrated. It's nice to go to something that actually meets your expectations. Two. Did you have a good night out? How was the concert? Oh, we didn't go in the end. Really? What a shame. I know. Hans was going to pick me up at seven, but as it happened, he had to finish some work at the office. And by the time we got there, there was a massive queue for tickets. So we decided we weren't going to get in and we went to a club instead. Oh, right. So what club did you go to? Radio City. Well, that's supposed to be really good. It's quite trendy, isn't it? That's what they say, but I hated it. Really? What was so bad about it? It was just awful. The people, the music, everything. It's one of the worst clubs I've ever been to. Really? Okay, maybe I'm exaggerating a bit. I mean, it was okay to begin with, but then it got absolutely packed, so you couldn't really dance properly. And it was boiling hot, so you were sweating like crazy. And then they changed the music later to this heavy techno stuff, which I hate. And the drinks were a rip-off. Oh, dear. Well, maybe you just went on the wrong night. Three. I'm so tired. I was out late last night. Really? I thought you said you were going to have a quiet night in. I know. I mean... I was going to stay in, but Clara phoned, and while we were chatting, she mentioned she had a spare ticket for this play in town, and so I said I'd go with her. All right. So what did you go and see? Anything good? Yes, actually. It was called A Man for All Seasons. Oh, I've been wanting to see that for ages. It's had some great reviews in the papers. How was it? Brilliant. One of the best things I've seen in a long time. That's what I'd heard. Yeah, it's so moving. Honestly, I was in tears at the end. And the whole staging, the lighting, the costumes, everything. It's just really well done. I'll have to go. Yeah, you should. Track 49 1 I said I'd do it, and I will. 2. I said I wouldn't, but in the end I did. 3. The divorce rate has risen dramatically over recent years. 4. There's been a steady fall in unemployment. 5. Much was said, but little was done. 6. There's not as much crime as there was in the past. Track 50 1 That's a nice photo. Who's that? Oh, it's a friend. And is that your cat? Yeah. It's so cute. I know. <laughs> Mind you, she's lucky she's still alive. Really? What happened? Well... When she was a little kitten, she actually got stuck inside the wall of our house. You're joking. How did that happen? We're not absolutely sure because we didn't see her disappear, but we think she crawled through a little hole in the floor in our bedroom and then she fell down the gap between the walls. Oh, no. Anyway, we were watching TV and we could hear these little cries coming from somewhere, but we were going mad because we couldn't see her anywhere. 
and then we worked out she was actually inside the wall. So how did you get her out? Oh, we had to call the fire service in the end and they basically broke a bit of the outside wall and they managed to get her out like that. Here, I think I still have a picture. Oh, look at that. Oh, that sad little face. I know. I'm glad we found her. Two. You'll never guess what happened last night. Go on. What? Well, I was writing some reports on my computer at home when I suddenly noticed a group of crows looking quite excited. They were all making this dreadful noise, so I went outside to see what was happening. And? Well, the crows were chasing a little parrot up and down the street. A parrot? What was it doing there? I have no idea. I guess it must have escaped from somewhere. Anyway, it was obviously very scared and cold. I felt really sorry for it, so I chased the crows away. The parrot was then sitting on my neighbour's roof, and I didn't want to leave it. Yeah? So, what happened in the end? Did you catch it? Yeah, I had to put some fruit and seeds on the ground to tempt it down, and then when it came down, I managed to catch it and put it into a box. We've got it at home now. Wow, that's mad. Actually, it reminds me of something I saw a few weeks ago. I was coming home from work on my bicycle when... Three... I really thought I was going to die. Honestly, I hope I never see another crocodile in my life. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> That's awful. It actually reminds me of something that happened to me last year in Indonesia. Oh, yeah? What was that? Well, I was there on holiday and I decided to spend a few days trekking through the jungle. Hmm. On the second day, we were walking along a path through the rainforest when, suddenly... These huge lizards came running out of the bushes from all sides. They were enormous, much bigger than me. Everyone ran away, leaving me with three of these monster lizards running towards me. I tried to scream, but just couldn't. I really thought they were going to eat me. Really? That sounds terrifying. So what happened? Well, luckily, the guides managed to stop the lizards with these big sticks they had, and so I managed to escape. Track 51 1 Oh, they're so cute. 2 He's so lovely. 3 He's so annoying. Four. Their dog is just really out of control. Five. It smells really bad. Six. It's just incredibly noisy. Seven. He even lets the cat walk on the table. Eight. He actually kisses the dog and lets it lick his face. Track 52 1 You'll never guess what happened last night. Go on, what? Well, I was walking home when I suddenly saw a horse standing there in the street. 2 I saw something really strange while we were away. Oh, yeah. What was that? We saw this whale stuck on the beach. Seriously? Still alive? Yeah. It was actually quite upsetting. We phoned the police to see if they could organise help. Three. I was just about to put my shoes on when I found a scorpion hiding in one of the shoes. Really? What was that doing there? I don't know. I guess it was just looking for somewhere to sleep. Four. We spent hours trying to persuade the cat to come down from the tree, but it refused to come. Oh no, that's awful. So what happened in the end? 
Well, eventually we gave up. But an hour later, it walked into the kitchen, looking for its dinner. 53. Obviously, Wilson's story is a tragedy. He had no real idea of the power of nature, and he died because of it. But I don't think he was stupid. Remember his terrible experience in the war. That can affect people in different ways, and maybe those terrible memories are what drove him. Then think about his achievement. Just reaching Everest was really amazing. All those difficulties he overcame, the flight to India, the walk, everything. And he showed skill in learning to fly, and amazing strength and determination. And he did it alone. That's so different to these people who pay to go up Everest. They arrive in helicopters. They carry almost nothing. And they're not just risking their own lives. They risk many lives. If a rope broke, how many people would fall? If a guide got injured, these amateurs couldn't help. And with so many of them, serious climbers have to wait in these really dangerous conditions. And if that wasn't bad enough, they leave so much rubbish on the mountain. Broken tents, ropes, empty oxygen bottles. Things that stay there forever in the freezing cold. 54. Now, you might think that countries and regions that are rich in natural resources, such as coal or oil, would have the strongest economies. In fact, though, they often suffer from something called the resource curse. How many of you have heard of this before? OK, a couple of you. Well, this phrase was first used in the 1990s by the writer Richard Orty, who argued that having lots of natural resources actually causes problems for the economy. Since then, his theory has been supported by several studies that have found that, yes, there are rich people in these countries, but on average, the typical person in resource-rich countries is less wealthy than in countries with few natural resources. The question is, why? What's happening? Well, I'm going to suggest four main reasons. Conflict, corruption, value of manufactured products, and instability. So, conflict. Where there are natural resources, there is big money to be made, but where there's big money, there's often big trouble and a fight for control. Local people are often forced to leave their land so that resources can be extracted, and that causes controversy. The anger may be worse because they receive no money for moving, and the profits from the extraction go to foreign companies or other parts of the country. Regions with large reserves may try to gain independence from the rest of the country so that they can control the natural resource. The result can be violent protests, even civil war. And you don't need me to tell you how oil has also caused expensive international wars. Then there's corruption. Profits from mining and drilling often go to politicians and officials rather than helping to build schools or hospitals for local people. Companies may give presents to officials to avoid expensive rules and regulations. I'm sure you know what I mean. Politicians may directly run a mining company or be employed by them on huge salaries. Thirdly, the basic materials like oil or wood are not as valuable as manufactured products made from them, like petrol or furniture. So, if you are a country with few resources, you have to do something else. So, you invest in manufacturing, and then these economies grow quicker than the countries which mainly produce natural resources. Why don't resource-rich countries invest in factories? Well, largely because of corruption and conflict. But... It's also because economic instability can reduce investment. Global prices of natural resources vary a lot. If the price falls suddenly, there is obviously crisis. But big price rises are also bad. When resource prices go up, 
the country's currency also rises. If the currency is high, factories can't sell their products because imports are cheap and exporting is expensive. These risks mean less investment is made, which then makes the economy depend more on the natural resource, which is why it's called a resource curse. Track 55 not every country rich in resources has suffered, though. A few have managed to become successful, and one of the best examples is the African state of Botswana. The country gained independence from Britain in 1966. It was then one of the world's poorest countries, but one year later, diamonds were discovered in the Kalahari Desert. In 1969, the government made an agreement with the South African company De Beers, and today, around a quarter of all the world's diamonds are mined there. For over 40 years now, profits have been invested in healthcare, education, and infrastructure such as roads. This investment has made the big difference, but it could only happen because there's a strong democracy and good government which, according to Transparency International, has the lowest level of corruption in Africa. Track 56 Creative Intense Loyal Sensitive Bright Calm Ambitious, charming, competitive, direct, diplomatic, modest. Track 57. Where did you disappear to? Yeah, sorry. I had to go and phone my brother and all. It's his birthday today. Oh, OK. It's just that you were quite a long time. I know. I was only going to be five minutes, just wish him happy birthday. But once he starts talking, he doesn't stop. Oh, that's like my mum. She can talk for hours. I sometimes think we could be on the phone and I could go off and have a coffee and then come back and she'd still be talking. She wouldn't have noticed I'd gone. Right. Well, I'm not sure he's quite that bad. OK, maybe I'm exaggerating, but she is very talkative. Anyway, it sounds like you and Noel get on well. Yeah, really well. Unfortunately, I don't see him that much now because he's living in the States. Really? What's he doing there? Is he working? No, he won a scholarship to study physics. Wow, he must be clever. He is. He's really bright, always top of his class. But, you know, he's not one of those intense, clever people. He's really funny and very good with people. Sounds a great guy. Do you have any other brothers or sisters? I don't think you've told me before. Maybe not. Uh, I've got a younger brother called Greg. And what's he like? Do you get on well? Yeah, I guess. You don't sound too sure. No, I mean, he's nice and everything. We're just... different. Yeah? In what way? I don't know. He's just so sensitive. I seem to obsess him a lot, anyway. Oh, yeah? Yeah, for example, he wants to be an artist, yeah? Oh, right. And the other week, I saw him at my mum and dad's, and he was talking about his big new art project, some kind of installation. Right. And I asked, so where and when is this going to be on? And he just got annoyed and went quiet. Oh? Basically, because it won't happen. He likes the idea of being creative, but he doesn't want to do the work. I've told him before, you need to be ambitious, push yourself more, or you'll never make any money. Oh, uh, right. What? No, you're right. It's tough being an artist. It's just that... What? Well, I guess you get plenty of criticism in the art world, and maybe he doesn't want his sister to be so direct. <laughs> Oh, right. So you think it's my fault? No, I I'm just saying... Whatever. It's hard. So, are we going for coffee? I guess. Track 58. 
Track 58 1. Doug I met him while doing a summer job in England. We were both working in this cafe. He was in the kitchens and I was a waiter. Our boss was a, a bit of an idiot. He was really strict. He was always shouting at us and was just horrible. Anyway, we used to go out after work and we'd sit and complain about our boss. We'd talk about the things we wished we'd said to him. Nicholas was always very funny about it. 2. Sandra We were dating for a while. I met him when we were studying in Rome on an Erasmus programme. It was a great few months. He was always so much fun and so full of life. We tried to keep the relationship going after he went back to Belgium, but it's difficult maintaining a long-distance relationship. We couldn't afford to visit each other very often, and in the end, we split up. We've remained friends, which I suppose is important, but I sometimes wish we'd stayed together. Yeah. I wish we hadn't split up. 3. Shane I met him while I was backpacking. We were staying in a hostel and we had to share a room. We got talking and found we had a lot in common. We ended up spending a couple of weeks sightseeing until I went back to Australia. We kept in touch via email and social media after that and two years ago I moved to Britain. Since then, I've been over to Belgium to see him a couple of times. 4. Brigitte We met at university. We didn't have much to do with each other at first, as we're so different. I think I'm quite sociable and outgoing, and as you probably know, he's a bit quiet and shy. It's not that we didn't get on at all. We'd see each other in class and in the library and we'd chat a bit. Over time though, our chats got longer and then, just before we left university, I asked him out on a date. He looked a bit surprised, but he said, OK, and we'd been seeing each other now for about two years. It's a shame it took so long for us to get together, really. 5. Frank I met him through a friend, Jeff, who he was sharing a flat with. We all used to hang out together, so I talked to Nicholas and got to know him very well. At some point, I had an argument with Jeff. It was about something stupid, but we basically stopped talking to each other. We're both very stubborn, and I didn't want to be the first to apologize, but of course, neither did he. I regret that, really. I wish we'd managed to sort things out between us, but there you go. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I haven't seen Jeff for years, but I'm still friends with Nicholas. Track 59 1. I wish I'd known. 2. I wish I'd met him. 3. I wish they'd told me earlier. 4. I wish I'd tried harder at school. 5. I really wish we hadn't moved house. 6. Honestly, I wish I hadn't said anything. 7. I wish I hadn't gone to the meeting. 8. I sometimes wish they'd given me a different name. Track 60 1. I used to, but I don't anymore. 2. I tried it, but I really wish I hadn't. 3. I'd go there all the time when I was a kid. 4. They found it again two days after it had been stolen. 5. I could see it from the hotel but didn't manage to visit. 6. We couldn't use the pool because it was being cleaned. Track 61 1. 
Thanks for picking us up. It's really kind of you. That's okay. It's no problem. So, how was your journey? Oh, quite stressful actually. It's a relief to finally be here. Oh no, what happened? You weren't delayed or anything, were you? No, no, it wasn't that, thank goodness. But everything else that could go wrong did. To begin with, we almost missed the flight because Andre didn't want to spend too long hanging around at the airport. I've already said I'm sorry. He said we'd be okay if we got there an hour and a half before takeoff, but there was a huge queue at the check-in desk and then another one going through security. So in the end, we only just caught the flight. How come it was so busy? It's not really the holiday season. Exactly. They were doing extra security checks for some reason. Oh, right. Whatever. If we'd been there earlier... Okay, okay. Anyway, the flight was dreadful too. Awful. We hit a big storm coming over France and it was so bumpy. Honestly, at one point, I thought we were going to crash. I was sweating. That sounds terrifying. It was. I don't want to go through that again, I can tell you. Me neither. I'm sure. What do you want to do now? Do you want to go and get something to eat or do you want to check in at the hotel first? Two. Hi, there you are. I was starting to worry. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm so late. I had a bit of a nightmare getting here. Oh, really? How come? Well, to begin with, it was still dark when I set off. Really? What time did you leave? Six. And then it immediately started to pour down, so the roads were really slippery. Oh, I hate driving in the rain, especially in the dark. So do I. That's probably why I took a wrong turning. I got completely lost and ended up going round in circles for ages. I couldn't work out where I was or where I was going. Then, when I finally got back onto the right road, I almost had an accident. Seriously? What happened? Oh, it wasn't anything bad. It was just this stupid guy in a big expensive car who drove straight across me. I had to brake to avoid hitting him. I wasn't hurt or anything, but I did have to stop and park the car for a few minutes to calm down. Oh, you poor thing. That's awful. But that's male drivers for you. Track 62 1 What was the weather like in Peru? Was it hot? No, it wasn't actually. We arrived at night and it was freezing. Then during the day it was still chilly and cloudy. Oh dear. I wish I'd taken some warmer clothes. I only had t-shirts and one thin jacket. Oh no! It was stupid. I should have thought more carefully before setting off. I knew we'd be in the mountains and could have checked the forecast. I guess. But South America? You assume it'll be hot. Exactly. It's silly really. Anyway, we still had an amazing time. 2. Hello? Hello, Mum. It's me, Alan. Oh, hello. I was worried. Did you arrive safely? Yeah, sorry. We got here late. That's why I didn't phone. Oh, right. So, is everything okay? Are you both well? Yeah, fine. Except for the cockroaches in the hotel. Cockroaches? Yeah. We stayed in this little place last night and the room was filthy. That's horrible. We were silly. We should have looked around more, but because we got here so late, we just chose the first cheap place we came across. Oh, Alan. Don't worry. We'll check the place out better next time. I hope so. Three. How was Greece? Nice and hot? Yes, it was. It was boiling. Lucky you. I bet that was nice. It was, but I did get sunburnt on the first day. Oh, no! It was really hot and I was sunbathing and just fell asleep. The next day, my skin went purple. It was horrible. Oh, you poor thing. Oh, it was my own fault. I shouldn't have stayed in the sun for so long, especially with my skin. I should have at least put on some sun cream. Four. Hello, sir. Are all three of you flying together to Prague? Yes, that's right. In that case, I'll just need to weigh your bags. Sure. I'm afraid you have to pay an excess baggage charge of 100 euro on this bag. What? But there are three of us. The baggage allowance is 15 kilos each. 
I'm sorry, sir, but the rules are very clear. The maximum for any one bag is 15 kilos, and this one weighs 25. You can transfer some weight to your hand baggage if you like. How can we fit 10 kilos in there? It's tiny. Well, in that case, you need to pay the excess. Oh, that's ridiculous. I'm sorry, but it really isn't my fault. The ticket conditions are very clear. I'm afraid you have to go back to the desk over there and pay the excess. But the queue's huge. I told you we should have bought another suitcase. I, I just thought it would be easier with two. One hundred euro! That's such a rip-off! Track 63 1 How did you find the museum? It was absolutely packed when we went. It was busy, but it wasn't too crowded. 2 you must be angry they've lost your luggage. Yeah, I am. I'm absolutely furious. Three. You must be exhausted after such a long journey. I am a bit tired, but I actually slept on the plane for a while. Four. You must be hungry after such a long journey. I am. I'm absolutely starving. Have you got anything to eat? Five. How was the journey back? Did you get wet in that storm? We got absolutely soaked. I didn't have an umbrella or anything. Six. Did you like the food? I thought it was absolutely delicious. Yeah, it was quite tasty, but I've had better. Seven. The place we stayed in was a bit dirty. A bit? It was absolutely filthy. I couldn't believe it. 8. I've heard Tabriz is a very interesting city. Yeah, it is. It's fascinating. It has so much history. Track 64. 1. Hello, help desk. Yeah, hi there. I wonder if you can help me. I've just turned on my computer and found that the internet's down. What? No, all of it? That's a disaster. What? Oh, nothing. <laughs> just my little joke. <laughs> Have you checked all the connections? Maybe something's not plugged in properly? I think everything's okay, yes. One minute. Let me just have one more look. Yup, I've just checked all the plugs and sockets again. But it hasn't made any difference. Hmm. Well, in that case, there's probably an issue with the cable then. I'll come down and have a look in a bit, OK? Two. Hello, IT. Hi. I've got a bit of a problem. My computer crashed this morning, and when I turned it back on, all the folders I keep my files in had disappeared from the screen. OK. Well, you must have backup copies somewhere, right? On an external hard drive or in the cloud? I'm afraid not. It's stupid of me, I know, but I always forget to copy them. Right. Well, in future, you might want to think about backing up more often. Have you tried rebooting at all? Um, what does that mean? Turning it off and turning it on again. Oh, OK. I need these things in plain English, you see. But yes, I have, and it didn't do any good. OK. Have you tried searching for specific files by name? No, not yet. Should I? Yeah. Try that and see if anything comes up. Three. Hello, help desk. Hi there. I've got a bit of a problem down in accounts. I'm trying to print some files, and every time I go to select print from the drop-down menu, my cursor just turns into that spinning wheel of death thing, you know, that circle that just goes round and round and round. I move it away with the mouse, and it stops and goes back to normal. Honestly, it's driving me mad. OK, that's a very specific problem. I'm not sure I've dealt with anything like that before. I think you may have got a virus. Have you run a security scan? No, I haven't, but I could if you think it'll help. Yeah, try that and see what happens. 
it should find any unwanted software that's hiding away in there, and it'll give you greater protection in future if you need it as well. Okay. Otherwise, let me Google it and see what I can find. Four. Hello, IT Help Desk. Hi, Bob. It's me. Martin again, I'm afraid. Let me guess. Password problems? Yeah, sorry. I'm just hopeless at remembering these things. What is it now? Uh, three times this month? At least. But don't worry. You're not the worst offender. It's the age we live in. I've got more passwords than I have friends. I'll reset it for you and email you a new one in a minute, OK? <laughs> Thanks. Have you tried that app, by the way? I think it's called All My Passwords. No. Well, try that. It might help. Otherwise, you might need to get some more memory installed. Track 65 1. Have you tried downloading it? 2. Yeah, but I didn't have any success. 3. Maybe you should tell her. 4. Okay, I'll try that. Five. Otherwise, I don't know what else to suggest. Six. I've tried, but it didn't make any difference. Seven. Okay, well, have you looked on the internet? Eight. No, not yet. Do you think I should? Nine. Otherwise, you're probably best doing an actual course somewhere. Track 66 The computer and video games industry has experienced remarkable growth. Worth around $25 billion around a decade ago, interactive entertainment now generates well over $100 billion a year worldwide, a figure which is only going to rise in the coming years. The industry is home to many different occupations and employs hundreds of thousands around the world. Video games can cost as much to produce as major Hollywood movies and can earn much more. 2014's Destiny, for instance, cost $500 million to develop, twice as much as any film made that year. But apparently, following its release, the game made that money back in just one day. Yet many still see gaming as child's play, and the industry still struggles to be taken seriously. With over 1.2 billion people now playing games, 700 million of them online, perhaps it's time to reconsider our ideas of who gamers are and why they spend so much time and money on their passion. Track 67 Welcome to another 3Js podcast, totally great or total rubbish. For those joining us for the first time, me, Jermaine, and my friends James and Jody review random stuff chosen by listeners and decide if they're totally great or total rubbish. That's it. No maybes. It's all or nothing. You're either grade A or a hopeless fail. So first up, it's me with Cry for Help, an app to scare off attackers. Okay, imagine walking home at night. Someone's following you, a robber or worse. You open the app and... Help! <laughs> no one's going to attack you with that screaming in their ear. Ha, oh, come on. What's wrong with using your own voice? You haven't had that dream where you want to scream but nothing comes out. Uh, it's a dream, right? Not reality. They might cover your mouth. Or smash your phone. True. Apart from that, some creep's considering robbing me, right? So I pull out a £500 phone and start searching through my apps. You don't think he might be more tempted to rob me? She has a point. It's rubbish. Good for scaring your little brother, though. Help! No maybes. Total rubbish. OK, a hopeless fail. So, James, what about your universal translator? Yeah, basically, it's an app that allows you to speak in a foreign language you don't know. You just say the words in English, and the app plays a spoken translation with the correct accent. Wow, sounds cool. Having something like that on your travels has to be good, no? 
It's good in theory, but it's difficult to know if the translation is accurate. So I asked a Chinese friend to try it out with me. Ha! <laughs> Any good? Well, some were okay, like hello, goodbye, can I have a coffee, stuff like that. Cool. But I did try and say, your mum's nice, and apparently it said, I like your cow. <laughs> Dude, I'm not sure what's more embarrassing, the translation or saying your mate's mum is nice. <laughs> she made us cookies. Okay. Whatever. What about the other way round? Oh, it only recognises English at the moment. So you ask the way to the bank, but you can't follow the directions. Hardly a universal translator. True, but it is half the problem sorted in 12 languages. And the other people could point. They might even take you there. And if they try and attack you on the way, it could translate this. Help! Exactly. Saves you having to learn a language. I'd say it's totally great. OK, you win. Universal translator, we are agreed. You are totally great. Which brings us to Jody and the remote lock. So, you install this lock, and then you can use the app on your phone to lock or unlock it from anywhere. Australia, if you wanted to. Why on earth would you want to open a door from the other side of the world? Well, if you're travelling and you want to get into it... Track 68 1. I need it to fix this with. 2. You should have told me. 3. You shouldn't have done that. 4. If I'd known, I could have done something about it. 5. Being the boss's daughter made working there quite hard. 6. I'm really looking forward to seeing you all again. Track 69. 1. Hello, Mr Gomez. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, have you been waiting long? About two hours. I'm sorry, we're quite busy today. You've done something to your ankle. Yes. Mm. It's quite swollen. Does this hurt? Yeah, it's very painful. Can you put any weight on it at all? No, no. It hurts too much. Hmm, and how did you do it? I was just coming out of the hotel, and I slipped on the stair and my ankle, it just... You just fell over on it. Nasty. Well, I think we should do an x-ray. It might just be badly sprained, but it could be broken. You'll have to wait again, I'm afraid. We've been a bit short of staff lately. I'll ask the nurse to give you something for the pain. Good. How long will I have to wait for the x-ray? Hopefully it won't be more than half an hour. Are you on any medication? Uh, I take something for my asthma. That's fine. Have you ever had any adverse reactions to any painkillers? Uh, paracetamol or anything? No, never. Okay, fine. Well, I'll get the nurse to give you something and then take you down for the x-ray. Two. Hello. 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 Take a seat. What seems to be the problem? It's my boyfriend. He's been up all night throwing up. He's hardly slept. He had a high temperature, 39, and his heart was beating really fast. And how long have you been like this? Sorry, he doesn't speak much English. He first said he felt a bit sick yesterday afternoon and then he threw up about seven and he hasn't really stopped since. Oh dear. Any diarrhoea? Actually, no, none. And has he been able to drink anything? No, that's the problem. When he drinks water, he's sick again. Right, well, let's have a look. Can you just take off your jumper and sit up here? Open your mouth and stick your tongue out. Lovely. And now take a deep breath. Again. Breathe in. And out. Just lie down. I'm going to press quite hard. Does it hurt? And here? Mm, it's okay. Maybe a bit uncomfortable, but no pain? Yes, no pain. Okay. You can put your jumper back on. 
I think it's viral gastroenteritis, so there's no need for antibiotics. I'll give him an injection to stop the vomiting, and then he just needs to rest and take lots of fluids. Okay? Any questions? No, I don't think so. I'll explain to him. Seventy. How was your holiday? You went mountain biking in Austria, didn't you? That's right. It was great, except for James's accident. Why? What happened? Well, we'd been cycling in the mountains round Kaunatal, and we were going back to the hotel down this steep road. James went round this tight bend too fast, and he went off the road into some bushes and fell off. It was horrible. It sounds it. Was he badly hurt? Well, we thought so. We were worried that he'd maybe hit his head because he kept asking us where he was and what had happened. He just seemed really confused. At one point, actually, he even asked if we'd met somewhere before. Really? Yeah, and we could see that his knee was very swollen as well. He also had quite a few cuts and bruises and was bleeding quite a bit. The problem was, though, we were still miles from the next village. So, what happened? How did you get him to a hospital? Well, luckily, we were actually on a road and a car came past a minute or two later. It stopped and the woman driving said she'd take James to the nearest hospital. He kept saying he'd be okay, but she insisted. And in the end, we managed to get him to go, just to be safe. We got him into the car and she took my mobile number and promised to call me once there was more news. Wow, that was nice. I know. It was really kind of her. Anyway, we then cycled back to our hotel and waited to hear from the hospital. And did they call? Yeah, they did. After a couple of hours, they rang and told me they'd given James an x-ray and there was nothing broken and nothing wrong with his head. But they said he needed to stay there a bit longer, as he was waiting to have a few stitches in the cuts. Oh, poor guy. Yeah, I know. In the end, he spent the rest of the holiday hanging around the hotel. He was desperate to go out with us, but the doctors told him not to cycle for a week and to rest the knee. It spoiled his holiday, really. I bet. And, on top of all that, I spoke to him yesterday and he said he's going to have to buy a new bike now because of the accident. He's found out the bike frame's broken. Ouch. That actually reminds me of something that happened to some friends of mine when they went camping in Croatia. Track 71. 1. Did you see that thing in the paper about Shaney Wilson? No, what was that? Well, you remember she got married last September, right? Yeah, they were at that film premiere recently. He's that short blonde guy. Exactly. Well, she's just announced they're splitting up. Wow, that didn't last long, did it? Apparently, she found out that he's having an affair with some other Hollywood actress. So, did he get much of her money? Two. Did you see that thing on the Times website about the steel plant closing down? You're joking. Doesn't your friend Jim work there? Yeah, I haven't spoken to him yet. So, how come it's being shut down? Has the company gone bankrupt? No, apparently they're doing quite well. They even promised to expand last year. So, how come... Mm, the usual. It was taken over and the new management claim it's too expensive to run. They're moving production abroad. That's terrible. So how many people are going to lose their jobs? Three. Did you see that thing on TV about that murder in town? Yeah, it's shocking, isn't it? How can someone stab someone to death in a crowded place like that in the middle of the day and then get away? I know. Apparently, no one offered to help the victim or did anything to stop the guy who did it. It is bad, but then again, what would you have done? 4. Have you heard the news? No, what? The deputy president's resigned. Really? Why's that? Haven't you been following the story? He's been accused of doing all kinds of things, like apparently... He took illegal payments connected to that new national sports stadium. Right. Not that he's admitted doing anything. He just apologised for causing the government difficulties. Right. So what else has he been accused of? 
5. Did you see that thing in the paper about Real Madrid wanting to sign Geraldinho? I、oh、know, it's bad news for our team, isn't it? Apparently, he's refused to play in any friendly matches before the start of the season. Well, that's that then. This is going to be a terrible season. We needed to buy a top midfielder, not sell one. Well, Real are supposed to be offering 40 million, which will help. Maybe. But who are we going to get to replace him? Track 72. 1. Have you seen that thing on Twitter about that tennis player, James Jenkins? Yeah, what an idiot. Apparently, it's been retweeted a million times already. 2. Have you seen that video on YouTube of the Prime Minister trying to dance to hip hop? Yeah, it's so funny, isn't it? Apparently, it was from before he went into politics, though. 3. Did you see that thing on TV about them building a new airport? Yeah, it's good news, isn't it? Apparently, it's going to create a thousand jobs. 4. Did you see that thing on the news about the murder near here last night? Yeah, it's awful, isn't it? Apparently, the victim was quite young. Five. Did you see that thing on the Times website about Shaney Wilson getting arrested? Yeah, it's sad, isn't it? The media are obsessed with that woman. Track 73. One. Who's the statue of? That's Garibaldi. Garibaldi? You've never heard of him? No, I don't think so. Who was he? He was a military leader in the 19th century who helped unify Italy. He's like a national hero. He fought in South America as well. He was part of the liberation struggles in Brazil and Uruguay. I think his first wife was even Brazilian. I'm surprised you haven't heard of him. Well, I'm not really interested in history. Two. You've been away, haven't you? Yeah, I went to Germany as part of a Comenius project. Comenius project? Yeah, it's a European Union scheme which provides grants to teachers so that they can go on courses or set up partnerships with other schools abroad. Sounds interesting. I've never heard of it. Why Comenius then? What does that mean? He was a Czech writer who wrote about education. Apparently, he's seen as the father of modern education. Oh, yeah. I've never heard of him. Well, to be honest, neither had I before I went on this course. He sounds incredible, though. He was writing in the 17th century, but even then, he was arguing for education for both boys and girls. Really? Wow, that was very radical. Yeah, and he was against just learning by heart, you know? He wanted kids to learn by actually doing things, and he encouraged them to think for themselves. He was really ahead of his time. He sounds it. Three. So, what are you gonna do while you're in Brussels? Work mainly, but I'm hoping to go to the Eddie Merckx metro station while I'm there. Really? Why do you want to go there? It's where they have Eddie Merckx's bike, which he used to set the owl record. What? What are you talking about? Eddie Merckx? He's like the greatest cyclist of all time. They named the metro station after him, and it has all kinds of memorabilia there. Oh, right. You've never heard of him? Uh, no. And you're not planning to go anywhere else, like the Magritte Museum? Magritte? The surrealist painter. He was the guy that did pictures of office workers raining down from the sky.、Mm, it doesn't sound familiar. Ceci n'est pas une pipe. Sorry, you've lost me. <laughs> you must know it. It's one of his paintings. It's a picture of a pipe, and underneath it says, This is not a pipe in French. You'd recognize it if you saw it. It's really famous. Yeah, well, so is Eddie Merckx, but you didn't know him. Track 74 1.
I've been under a lot of stress lately. 2. Hopefully it's just an upset stomach. 3. They asked if I was allergic to anything. 4. He's never apologised for saying what he said. 5. It didn't happen during the time that I worked there. 6. She's been accused of stealing money at work. Comes Intermediate Tests by Mike Sayer Published by National Geographic Learning A part of Cengage Learning Copyright 2016 Review Test 1 Listening Hello and welcome to People and Books. My guest today is 18-year-old Danny Baines, who, despite his young age, has already won numerous awards. Welcome to the programme, Danny. Hello. So, have you been writing novels for very long? Well, yes, for most of my teens, I guess. At 13, all I wanted to do was play football. Then, a year later, I was suddenly into books, and it was then that I sat down and wrote and wrote. My first childish attempt at a novel was about 200 pages long and pretty scary if I remember. I think I was really into horror stories at the time. It was quite depressing too, not uplifting at all. I don't know where it came from. So did you try to get it published? Well, my parents thought it was really good and my dad was much keener than I was to see my name in print. He sent it to a friend of his who worked for a big publishing company, but they weren't interested. Were you disappointed? Oh, no, not really. I was already writing my next novel by then. I'd spent six months writing it, and I thought it was great. Of course, when I sent it to the publisher, it came back with lots and lots of suggested rewrites. I had to rewrite the story many times. All in all, I spent, well... A couple of years of my life on it, and at times it seemed like I did nothing much except write. But it was worth it because the publishers accepted it. I was only 17 at the time. It was really amazing. And that was The Only Child? Yeah, that's right. Right. Tell me about your latest novel. Yes, my second, or at least the second one to be published. It's called The Handmade Pot, and it's a love story set in Italy. I wanted to do something a bit different from the adventure stories or horror stories I've written before, and I think it works well. I don't think it's dull or bland. It certainly isn't. It's a thrilling story. It must be exciting to be getting such good reviews. Absolutely. I'm very lucky to be a published author at such a young age. It's a rewarding and varied job, but what makes it worthwhile is when other people praise my work and buy my books. Review Test 2. Listening. Hi, Emma. Hi, oh, hi, Moira. How's your course going? Well, it's really hard work, as you can probably imagine, but it's going okay, I guess. Hard work? Already? You've only just started, haven't you? I thought they wouldn't be all that demanding early on, you know, until you'd got the hang of things. Oh, I wish. I know I've only been on the course for two weeks, but the coursework is really heavy. I've been given lots of homework, and I have a presentation to prepare. That does sound like a lot of work. Believe me, it is. I have three essays to do before Christmas. I don't know how I'm going to get it all done. In fact, I'm thinking of taking a few days off work, just so that I can keep up. I don't want to find myself struggling. Well, no, but you can't afford to miss too many days off work either, can you? I suppose not. I guess you won't have any free time this weekend, then. I thought we might meet up. Well, I reckon I have to prepare my presentation, and I have to start working on the first essay. I guess that means I'll be working all day on Saturday, but hopefully I'll have some time off on Sunday. I was thinking of doing a bit of reading, then, for the essay. Why don't you pop round late Sunday afternoon for coffee? 
Okay, I'll do that. It sounds like you've got things organised at least. Well, yes. Although there's lots of coursework to do, thankfully I've been working in this field for years, so it's not as if I'm trying to learn something completely new. And I love it, of course. I'm really keen. My tutor's really encouraging, and I know the qualification will be good for my CV once I get it. Well, that's good. It's the commute to college that I find hardest. It took me two hours to get back last night. I have two buses to catch to get there. And the same coming back. It's exhausting. I bet. I feel exhausted just listening to you. Review test three. Listening. I haven't seen Karen all morning. Do you know where she's gone? Yeah, she's gone into town to get a new laptop. Her old one keeps crashing and it's really slow. It's about time she got a new one. I guess so. So which laptop is she going to buy? Well, she's spent ages online researching all sorts of different ones. And she's even bought technical magazines. Now she's going to ask for advice from the experts in the electrical shop. But to be honest with you, I still don't think she has any idea which one she wants. Well, I'm not that surprised. Karen's never been very good at making her mind up. <laughs> Yesterday she was telling me she'd seen a couple of laptops she likes. They're both KP computers. There's the 740, which has a large screen and a lot of memory, and the 850, which has the same amount of memory and is smaller and slimmer and looks really cool. I think she prefers the 850, but it's more expensive. Has she thought about what she's going to use it for? I mean, it's important to choose a laptop to suit your needs. Well, she's into playing games online and spends ages on social media chatting to friends and uploading photos and videos. So that's the main thing. She won't really need it for work or study. Really? I thought she was doing a design course. Won't she need it for that? Well, she is, but she's already got a really powerful desk computer which she uses to do all that. Oh, OK. So, what do you reckon? Which laptop will she end up buying? Well, she's not that well off and won't want to spend too much, so I think she'll buy the 740. I think you're right. She won't buy anything horribly expensive. Actually, I suspect she won't buy a laptop today at all. You know, Karen, she loves window shopping. She prefers spending time looking at gadgets to actually buying them. Mid-year test. Listening. OK, Bethany, well, as you know, I've asked to interview you because you're such a proficient linguist. You speak five languages pretty fluently, is that right? Including English, five, yes. <laughs> To help me write my dissertation, I wanted to find out a little bit about your language learning history. Is that okay? Sure, far away. Can you tell me when you started learning each of your languages? Well, I was brought up speaking English mostly, but as my dad was Danish and my grandparents didn't really speak a word of English, I had a lot of exposure to this other language, Danish, which I kind of learned passively. As a small child, I knew what my Danish grandparents were saying, especially when they were talking about me. Would you say you were bilingual then? Well, not really. As I said, it never occurred to me to speak Danish, because my parents and friends all got by in English. But I suppose I got used to the idea that not every language is pronounced in the same way that English is, and that's been useful in learning other languages. Actually, I forgot Danish completely in my early teens and only learnt the language properly when I spent a year in Copenhagen after I left school. And I was 18 then. Hmm, OK. And the other languages? Well, I studied French all the way through school, starting when I was seven, and I did a degree in French and Spanish at university and spent some time in Paris. I guess it was the trip to Paris when I was 20 that was the most important part of becoming good at French. As for Spanish, well, I was dreaming in Spanish well before I got to university. Between the ages of 12 and 16, I lived in Madrid because my parents were working there 
And although I went to an international school where the main language was English, I made Spanish speaking friends and became, well, very Spanish for a time. Spanish? Oh, yes. As a kid, I enjoyed the acting element of speaking Spanish. I could be a different person, cooler and more outgoing, waving my arms around, that sort of thing. I loved being fiery in Spanish, and I still do. I'm a different person when I speak Spanish. <laughs> okay, interesting. That makes four languages, I reckon. What's the fifth one? Well, the fifth one is a bit of a cheat. My boyfriend comes from Norway, and I've been learning Norwegian off him for the past few months. I don't know whether you know this, but Danish and Norwegian are pretty similar. The pronunciation is very different, but the grammar's the same, and a lot of the words are identical. So it's probably been the easiest language to learn of all of them, especially as my boyfriend is such a good teacher. End of year test one. Listening. Hello and welcome to Health Today, the weekly phone-in that aims to advise listeners on what to do about just about anything, from a nasty rash to a twisted ankle. Dr. Deborah Clark is here with me. Give us a call on 0800 566 566. How are you, Doctor? Me? Well, I'm fine right now. Bit tired, that's all. I had a bit of a cold earlier this week, but it's cleared up. Mm, I'm glad to hear that. Our first caller is Ed on line one. Hello, Ed. What would you like to ask Dr. Clark? Hello. Yes. Well, it's about this persistent migraine I keep getting. An awful pain in my head. I felt terrible since I got up this morning. I've taken pills, but they don't seem to help. What should I do? Any adverse reactions to taking the pills? Well, no. They just don't work, that's all. OK. Well, cut out the pills until you've had the cause properly diagnosed. With headaches, the first thing and the best thing to do is drink lots of water and eat something good and healthy. If that doesn't help, lie in a dark room. You shouldn't take things which could make the problem worse. What's important is finding out why you have the problem in the first place. Do you work, Ed? Yes, yes I do. I deal with customers' complaints on the phone. For an online travel specialist. You know, if they've booked a holiday and had problems, they call me. So you spend time staring at a computer screen while you're dealing with clients? That's right. OK. Well, there's your cause, or at least that might be the root cause. People develop severe headaches or migraines for all sorts of reasons, ranging from their diet to the way they heat their house. But a common cause is what we do at work. So you may have a headache because you look at a screen all day. Or it may be because you feel stressed by having to deal with problems. I'm guessing it's the computer screen. Try to limit how much time you have to stare at the screen. If I were you, I'd talk to my supervisor and take more breaks. Oh, OK. Well, thanks, Doctor. Thanks for your call, Ed. Right, our next caller is Martha. She's on line two. End of year test two. Listening. In Britain, house prices continue to rise, particularly in London, and the number of people who are homeless is becoming ever greater. We are told that the problem lies in the fact that there is a shortage of properties. The number of people looking for new homes is growing faster than the speed at which houses are being built. But is there a solution out there? In today's programme, we're talking to Tony Donald, who believes that we can solve the housing crisis with a little bit of imagination and creativity. So, Tony, what's your solution? Well, I wouldn't say that I have a solution. But I do think that we can make much better use of the space that we have in our crowded country. Why wait for developers to build new homes when we can create them ourselves? So you think we should be building our own houses? Well, not build so much as create. New houses are being built in parts of the country where people don't want to live. 
But not enough is being done to free up spaces in popular towns or cities and to adapt places that already exist for housing. For example? Well, for example, we have lots of attractive rivers and canals going through our towns, but not that many people are living in boats. We could create whole communities of people living on canal boats or in houses built on the river. There are lots of woods too, and I see no reason why we couldn't have tented villages in woods. Technology has been developed which allows us to make hard-wearing tents that you can suspend from trees. They're light, strong and comfortable, and lots of young people would just love to live in a treehouse. OK, but wouldn't that be a problem for other people who want to go for a walk in the woods or on a trip down a canal without seeing other people's washing? Well, I know what you mean, but I think the housing crisis is so great that we should stop seeing empty places as places to be protected and start seeing them as places to be shared. If people look after the places they live in, they'll be attractive and interesting places for other people to visit. OK, I suppose you're saying that we should all share the space we have. Yes, and there are so many opportunities to do that. We could create living spaces out of disused buses or caravans or railway carriages. And we could turn basements into flats, roof terraces into cool penthouse apartments and garages into cottages. I really don't see what's stopping us.